I like having tea. Beautiful day. Nice to have that heat break a little bit. It was so <laughs> hot. <laughs> actually, it's cold in our, our house. Yeah, it was actually cold last night. Mm -hmm. I was really surprised. I got up and got a blanket in the middle of the night. I yeah. thought, that's really strange. Because all week it has been so hot. Yeah. You feel settling so far. Look, I saw him. I thought he could give away, give me a small cup. Oh, he did. Yeah, he <laughs> gave me like a tiny little cup. <laughs> Handed it back to him. He's like, no way. He is your son for sure. Yeah. So the trip up was all right. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. We stopped in Jackson. Tennessee. It's been a night there. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, it feels good. And the house is all ready to move into? Yes, it is. Next when, Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, moving. We are Wednesday. living there already. Are you really? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Living there. Think? Well, it was already furnished, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So you could actually just move in the way it was mm -hmm. and, and then wait for the furniture to come. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of nice. Did it come with kitchen things too? Yeah, kitchen everything. Had pots and pans and things? No, no. Elsa, Elsa borrowed me. Oh, so. did she? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, no bedroom, but uh, living room and dining room. Dining room. Oh, there was no bed or anything in there? No. Oh, mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I, knew, I know that a lot of them came furnished, but I haven't really looked at them in years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dan and Susan are online. They said, good morning, everyone. Happy morning. Sabbath and pleased to see everyone. Yeah, nice. You already streaming? Yeah, I already started. Yeah. Well, it's already, well, that's 11.59, technically. Mm -hmm. mm. I didn't even open up the Kindle yet. We even tested the streaming and it was working today. Okay. All right, guys, fine. The video's okay? Yeah. It was good this morning. At least it was when we tested it. Apparently it only works in this USB port. Yeah, it's the one I plugged in into last week. Yeah. So if you're all set and everybody's all set, we just... Uh, it was well, a lot set. of people to pray for out in the Midwest and... Yeah. They said they had three levees that have breached, so they've had to evacuate people in Mississippi, Missouri, and Arkansas. Wow. Yeah. And they're possibly going to have to evacuate more in Oklahoma. Flooding. And it's the heartland of the United States where they grow most of the corn and wheat, and nobody has been able to plant this year. Mm. You guys hear about the shooting in Virginia Beach last mm -hmm. night? Yeah. yeah. People are going crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I got I get the news feed from the local TV station in Roanoke, and this week there have been three or four shootings, people mm -hmm. being killed in shootings. Mm -hmm. You know, used to be when we moved here, you might hear about somebody being shot once a month or every couple of months. This is like four times in one week. Yeah. Uh, very strange. All right. Well, anyway, uh, glad to have you joining us online. If you're tuning in, uh, and even at, if, uh, at a later time, glad to have you on board. We're going to go ahead and pause a moment and have a word of prayer again. Okay, so that's fine. Father, we want to thank you for bringing us together this morning, for uh, providing for us in every way. You've watched over us throughout the week. And uh, it has been a busy week, and there have been all kinds of blessings and challenges. I just want to thank you, Lord, for taking such good care of us. You are a wonderful Heavenly Father. We want to praise you this morning. We uh, ask that you uh, come and be with us in the form of your Holy Spirit, that you guide and direct in our time together. Uh, we need insight and instruction. We need understanding of your word. We pray, Lord, you provide that to prepare us to accomplish the things that need to be done at this late hour in earth's history. God, God and direct us to that end. Be with all those who couldn't be here this morning, and especially, Lord, we ask that you be with those on our prayer list. 
you know, all the, cir the circumstances and the situations, we just lift them up to you in arms of faith, trusting that you will take adequate care of all of those circumstances. And we thank you, Lord, for hearing and for answering our request, because we ask it all in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, for his sake. Amen and amen. amen. Okay, well, I'm glad, <coughs> glad to have you guys. And uh, Susan say the nervous. audio and video are excellent today. Oh, wonderful. <clears throat> Finally, we're getting the audio and video straight now. Yeah, it might be all that uh, solar activity, too, wreaking havoc. You never know. Anyway, we do, we do want to remember, especially those people out in the Midwest who are dealing with uh, all kinds of health, not health issues, but uh, weather-related issues. And around the planet, I'm sure there's lots more going on that we're not even uh, aware of. But uh, uh, we need to be a, we need to be a, a people in prayer for all the things that are going on. Anyway, we uh, as, as we customarily do, we have our story time, and we're talking about spiritual warfare, and we're just going to go ahead and continue with that. We're in a new chapter, and this one goes to the home of. Uh the newspaper editor, Marshall Hogan. Kate grabbed a kitchen towel and wiped her hands so she could pick up the phone. Hi there, it was Marshall. Kate knew what was coming. It had been happening a lot the last two weeks. Marshall, I'm cooking dinner and I'm cooking enough for all four of us. Yeah, well, and Marshall had that tone of voice he always used when he was about to weasel out of something. Marshall, she turned her back toward the living room where Sandy and Sean were studying and talking. She didn't want them to see the distress on her face. She lowered her voice. I want you home for dinner. You've been out late all this week. You've been so busy and so preoccupied. I hardly have a husband anymore. Kate, Marshall broke in. It won't be as bad as you thought. I'm just calling to say I'll be a little late. Not that I won't be there. How late? Oh, brother. How about an hour? Kate couldn't think of what to say. She only sighed in disgust and anger. Listen, I'll get there as soon as I can. Kate decided to say it over the phone. She might never get another chance any other time. Marshall, I'm concerned about Sandy. Well, what's wrong with her now? Uh, she could just punch him for that tone of voice. <laughs> Marshall, if you'd just be around here once in a while, you'd know. I don't know. She just isn't the same old Sandy anymore. I'm afraid of what Sean is doing to her what Sean is doing to her. I can't talk about it over the phone. Now Marshall sighed. All right, we'll talk about it. When, Marshall? Oh, tonight when I get home. Well, we can't talk right in front of them. Well, I mean, you know what I mean. Just get home, Marshall, she said, please. He hung up the phone with hardly a loving gentleness, and for a split second he regretted the act and thought about how it must have made Kate feel but he forced his thoughts onward to the next very pressing project, interviewing Professor Julian Langstrat. It was Friday evening. She should be home now. He dialed the number, and this time it rang and rang and rang one more time. Hello? Hello, this is Marshall Hogan, editor of the Ashton Clarion. Am I speaking with Professor Julian Langstrat? Yes, you are. What can I do for you, Mr. Hogan? My daughter Sandy has been in some of your classes. She seemed pleased to hear that. Oh, very good. <coughs> At any rate, I was wondering if we might set up a date for an interview. Well, you'd have to speak with one of my teacher assistants. They're the ones responsible for checking the progress and problems of the students. The classes are large, you understand. Well, no, that's not exactly what I had in mind. I was thinking I would like to interview you. Pertaining to your daughter? I'm afraid I don't know her. I wouldn't be able to tell you much. Well, we could talk a little about the class, of course, but I was also curious about the other interests you're pursuing there on the campus, the elective classes you've been teaching at night. Oh, she said with a down note that didn't sound promising. Well, that was part of an experimental college idea we were trying. If you wish to check that out, the registrar might have some old flyers available, but I should inform you that I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of granting any interview to the press, and I really cannot do so. So you're not willing to discuss the very influential people you have in your circle of friends? I don't understand the question, but it sounded like she didn't appreciate it either. 
you know, Alf Brummel, the chief of police, Reverend Young, Dolores Pinkston, Dwight Brandon, Eugene Baylor, Judge John Baker. I have no comment, she said sharply, and I really have other things that are very pressing. Is there anything else I can help you with? Well, Marshall said, and he thought he'd go ahead and try for it. I guess the only other thing I could ask you is why you ejected me from your class. Now she was getting indignant. I don't know what you're talking about. Your class on Monday two weeks ago. The psychology of self, I think it was. I'm the big guy you told to leave. She began to laugh incredulously. I haven't the slightest idea of what you're talking about. You must have the wrong person. You don't remember telling me to wait outside? I'm convinced you had me mixed up with someone else. Well, do you have long blonde hair? She said simply, good night, Mr. Hogan, and hung up on him. He stood there a moment and then asked himself, well, Hogan, what did you expect? He dropped the receiver into the, into the cradle and went out into the front office where a question from Bernice grabbed his attention. So I'd like to know how you're finally going to corner Langstrat, she quipped, flipping through some papers at her desk. Marshall felt like his face must be awfully red. Boy, your face sure is red, Bernice confirmed. Talking to too many temperamental women in one evening, he said, Langstrat was one of them. I thought Harmel was bad. She turned around excited. You got Langstrat on the phone? Yeah, for all of 32 seconds. She had absolutely nothing to say to me and she didn't remember kicking me out of her class. Bernice nodded. Isn't it funny how no one seems to remember having any encounters with us? Marsha, we must be invisible. How about very undesirable and very inconvenient? Well, Bernice said, going back to her paperwork, Professor Langstrat has probably been very busy, too busy to talk to nosy reporters. Just then, a wad of paper bounced off her head, and she turned around and saw Marshall looking over some lists. He looked like he couldn't possibly have tossed that little projectile. He said, I wonder if I should contact Harmel again, but he won't talk either. Just then, the same wad of paper bounced off his ear, and she looked at Bernice, and she was dead serious, all business. Well, obviously he knew too much, and it's my guess that he and both former Dean Straken are running good and scared. Yeah, Harmel talked that way, warning me. He said something like, I'd be out on my ear like everybody else. So who's everybody else? Yeah, who else do we know who could have been removed? She looked over some of her notes. Well, you know, now that I look over this list, none of these people have really been in their position for a very long time. So who do they replace, Marshall asked. Bernice said, we can check that out. In the meantime, the obvious thing is to call Straken and see what has, he has to say. <clears throat> so Bernice began to prepare an adequate counterattack as the paper balls began to fly. And all right, Marshall said, starting to crack up with laughter. I'll give him a call. But I think we'd better get out of here. My wife's waiting with dinner. So they finished and had to clean up the mess before they could leave. That's the end of that chapter. Yeah, that was kind of a not really. It's kind of a filling in the blanks filling, between the scenes. Yeah. There is um, a there is a section here that I I actually have time. Let me go on with this one. This is kind of behind the scenes too. Rafar paced up and down the dark basement room, chugging out that hot breath that became a layer of cloud obscuring him from the shoulders up. He pounded his fists together. He tore invisible enemies in shreds with his outstretched talons. He cursed and he fumed. As far as an evil angel. He's the head of the evil angels evil in this angel. particular area. Lucius stood with the other warriors, waiting for Rafar to calm down and give the reason for calling this meeting. Lucius was rather enjoying the little scene before him. Obviously, Rafar, who was such a great braggart, had been cut down to size in his meeting with the strong man. Lucius could hardly keep a hideous smirk off his face. Wouldn't the little angel tell you where you could find this? What was his name again? Lucius asked, knowing full well Tall's name. Tall, Rafar roared, and Lucius could detect Rafar's humiliation at the very sound of the name. The little angel, the helpless angel, told you nothing? Rafar's immediate response was a monstrous black fist cramped, clamped around Lucius's throat. Do you mock me, little imp? <coughs> Lucius had learned the right tone of groveling to please this tyrant. Oh, be not offended, great one. I only seek your pleasure. 
Then seek this tall, Rafar growled. He released Lucius and turned to all the other demons present. All of you, find this tall. I want him in my hands to shred him at my pleasure. This battle could be settled easily between the two of us. Find him and bring me word. Lucius tried to hide his words behind a whimpering tone, but they were specially selected for another purpose. Indeed we shall, great one. But surely this tall must be a formidable foe to have routed you at the fall of Babylon. Whatever will you do should we find him again? Will you dare assail him again? Rafar grinned with his fangs shining. You will see what your bale can do. And may we not see what this tall can do? Rafar drew close to Lucius and stared him down with fiery eyes. When I have vanquished this tall and hurled his little pieces across the skies as my victory banner, I will certainly give you your chance to better me, and I will relish every moment of it. Rafar turned away, and for an instant the whole room was filled with his black wings before he shot upward through the building and into the sky. For hours afterwards, as angels all over Ashton watched from their hiding places, the bale flew slowly over the town like a vulture, his sword visible and challenging. Up and down, back and forth he flew, weaving in and among the downtown buildings, soaring high above the town in graceful arcs. Down below, through the window of an obscure store basement, Sion watched as Rafar passed overhead again. He turned to his captain, who sat nearby on some appliance crates, with Guilo, Triskel, and Mota. Triskel, with the help of the others, was getting himself patched up and back together again. I don't understand, said Sion. What's he think he's doing? Tall looked up from Triskel's wounds and said matter-of-factly, he's trying to draw me out. He wants the captain, Moda added. Apparently he has offered great honors to whatever demon can find Captain Tall and report his whereabouts. Guilo said gruffly, the devils are crawling all over the church with no other aim. It was the first place they looked. Tall anticipated Sion's next question and answered it. Signa and the others are still at the church. We've tried to keep our guard there looking as it usually does. Sion watched Rafar circle over the far side of town and come back for another pass. I'd have trouble being taunted by such as him. Tall spoke the truth without shame. If I were to meet him now, I would most certainly lose, and he knows it. Our prayer cover is insufficient, while he has all the backing he needs. They could hear the rushing of Rafar's wings and see his shadow fall over the building for an instant as he passed overhead. We will all have to be very, very careful. Is that a good place to stop? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, what this is is a, a fictional account of spiritual warfare where a town is being, you know, impacted. And actually, the reality is, even though it's fiction, the reality is that is happening everywhere in the world. There's this battle, this controversy going on between good and evil. Mm -hmm. That's really what all this is about. Uh, we had our own little real life example of that yesterday. When, At least I uh, think it may be. Yeah, maybe so. Um, and that's the thing, you never really know how much you're being protected mm -hmm. and watched over until it becomes even more too obvious. Well, the funny thing is that, is that after the fact, I somehow knew. Yeah. Uh, we had a, a microburst come through here yesterday, uh, which is a like a mini hurricane for like 10, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Trees and limbs were being blown down. I mean, a lot of rain and, and wind and whatnot. Uh, the wind was probably gusting 70, 80 miles an hour. It was a storm that just came out of nowhere, too. It cropped up. Anyway, I had sent Rose on a mission <laughs> to, get, to get some light bulbs for the uh, for the car that, that needed to be inspected and we were hoping to coordinate it so that she would get back in time so we could take it to the inspection station because yesterday was the last day of the month well as it turns out uh, the, the spousal communication wasn't an ultimate because <laughs> you didn't have your cell phone i didn't have my you? cell phone with me but i went and checked it what she was going for and i was at the auto parts store asking him telling him what i had i even sent him pictures of what i had right. and he didn't answer me and i said well i'm tired of waiting i went on to the grocery store so when i, I got to call. the grocery store i get a phone call from him and it turned out he needed two bulbs and not just one i had only picked up one 
So I had to had to finish up and then go back down to the store. And yeah, of course then you, you didn't tell him that I was a little bit miffed at the <laughs> fact that you only picked up one. When we had been talking about the turn signals, you know, we have two turn signals and so we needed two bulbs. So I just, you know, I brought one in to show it to her to make sure she get, would get the right one, you know. Which is what and I went and got husbands right have to do one. with women that are. He didn't kind say of get two bulbs. <laughs> automotively challenged, should I say? But anyway, <laughs> so anyway, I, I I I was a little bit miffed, and so apparently she thought, well, I better go back and get another bulb. No, there and, wasn't any thinking about well, it. I knew I you needed it, we needed it. I was going to get. All right, it. so it was that delay though when she when she finally headed this way. Uh, there was a huge tree that had gone across the road. And she immediately recognized that had she had if she had gotten two bulbs to begin with, or if I had just come home, or if she had just come home, decided to heck with everything, um, that tree could have actually taken out the car uh, at that at that moment. So it had just fallen not too was, long before I got there, and there were several people trying to figure out what to do. Um, it was completely blocking the road. So it was one of those moments, and, and, and there were lots of limbs down all over the place, but that's the only place that I saw any trees down. And it took an entire tree. Across the road, yeah. Which was very funny because you know, it, just, it was just a tall maple tree, but it didn't appear to have been, it wasn't uprooted or anything, it just was snapped and across the street. Yeah. I don't think we, we realize that mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, you know, um, obviously God knows the end from the beginning. And mm -hmm. He knows how to keep us out of harm's way. And sometimes it's by causing a delay, causing us to do something so that we're not at a certain place at a certain time. And uh, that's kind of what this book is about. It's about that. See, ordinarily he would have had on. his phone with him, yeah. but he left it sitting in the car. Mm -hmm. And so I'm frustrated because now, I'm waiting for him to get back to me. And had he gotten right back to me, I would have picked up the in. second bulb headed down the road and been on my way. And I was watching the storm as I was coming in. Mm -hmm. Because coming in from town, I could see all of the clouds, but there was this big black wedge. It looked almost like a tornado. And I saw it was over in the direction of the house. And I thought, well, they must really be getting a storm. But it was so unusual of a cloud, I almost stopped to get a picture of it because it was very fierce looking. Mm -hmm. mm. And so I drive across the across the bridge and come up the hill and everything's dry. There's, it's sun shining, it's, it's a beautiful day. And I get to the top of the hill above the river and it looks like a war zone. That storm had just impacted one small segment and um, it was, I was dodging tree limbs and leaves were everywhere. It was, it was a mess. And the water was so heavy, I mean, there was so much rain that had come down in a short period of time that the water was running off the roadways, and I just thought, well, they must have gotten a really bad storm. And so I was really surprised to see that tree, <laughs> you know. And then I had to turn around and go back a long way around just to get back here again. So it was just interesting that that timing of everything. Typically, he would have had his phone on him. I would have had the communications. I would have been on my way, and I probably would have been right about there. Yeah, only in heaven we're going to learn about That's so right. many times that we were protected. We're protected and, and the things that irritated us were actually we're things saved, that protected us. Saved us. Saved us. Yeah. All those school buses, Dad. All those school buses. <laughs> yeah, just remember All those school buses. <laughs> He's so frustrated getting behind the buses, and they have to stop at every single driveway. Yeah. And yeah. He said the other day he saw some a lot where there was a, a little school bus for sale, and he said, "Wouldn't that be great revenge? I'll buy one of those and I'll drive in front of the school buses and stop at every driveway before they do." <laughs> anyway, so that's for another time. Um, what we've uh, been doing for the last several weeks is talking about marriage, and of course Elijah's been uh, leading out with that. And he's not here today. He's <coughs> interestingly, he's at a wedding. So uh, couldn't he, have been more appropriate. He is attending a wedding of one of his friends today. So, at any rate, uh, but we want to continue with the theme a bit. And I got to thinking about how you know marriage really is uh, an example uh, of the plan of salvation. 
the plan of salvation really is uh, an example of marriage uh, being illustrated. And so I thought what we would do is go ahead and look at some of the, the similarities there. And uh, I've actually been involved in a couple of wedding ceremonies over in the Middle East. Not intentionally, but unintentionally. You know, we, we'd go and stay at a hotel or something, and all of a sudden a wedding party would, would show up. And they had the line dance and the music and all that kind of thing. And it's quite a, a large production that goes on over there for over weddings. In over, over in, you know, this, that one happened to be in Jerusalem. But we were riding in Turkey one time out in the countryside. And all of a sudden we hear this music playing. And it's like a rock concert somewhere. I mean, out in the middle of nowhere. And we're, we're, <coughs> just, we're wondering and we're asking the tour guide, what is going on? You know, and he said, well, it's a wedding ceremony. And one of the ladies that was with us who was from England, she said, oh, well, too bad we're not invited. Just, you know, kind of being uh, off the cuff there. And he said, oh, but you are. And they followed the music <laughs> and ended up pulling into the driveway. And what we didn't understand at the time was that if you show up, I mean, you know, we would consider that like crashing away, right? Mm -hmm. But they look at it from a different perspective. Um, and we don't know anybody there, and they don't know us. You don't right? even speak the language. We don't even speak the same language. But for us to go to the wedding, uh, to them, th 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 then all of a sudden their wedding becomes the talk of the whole village. Because international guests showed up at their wedding. Mm -hmm. And you become, the, you become the honored person at their wedding. And this is so kind of cool because uh, the, uh, this, this uh, couple from England, you know, they were out there and doing the line dance. I mean, they just got right involved with the whole thing, you know. They thought it was so neat to be a part of the culture there. Uh, but uh, a Middle Eastern wedding is different than our weddings. I've been to some weddings here in the States where they may have lasted 15 minutes. You know, the couple... The, the song plays, the couple walks down the aisle, the, the, the preacher says Actually, a few... Actually, the one that, the first one that my sister had... The preacher says a few words. Six minutes from start to finish. Yeah, the preacher says a few words, six and they, minutes. you know, kiss the bride, and then walking out, and it's like, done. Well, you can also just get eloped as well in America. <laughs> well, right, but over over in the Middle East, I mean, some of these things take, uh, are week-long productions, you know. And when you think about the plan of salvation, that's really what the plan of salvation has become. It's kind of like a, a, a great prophetic week production over the course of maybe 7,000 years. And uh, um, a lot of similarities. Now, I just jotted a couple of them down here. One of the things that happens in a traditional Middle Eastern wedding, they go through a process where you have to choose the bride. There's a choosing of the bride, right? And then there's the sending of the go-between. We'll talk about that. And then there's the betro uh, betrothal. And then there's actually the wedding ceremony. Okay? And so I thought what we would do is take a look at those, those uh, four things this morning and see how they parallel. Uh, or you'll see how they parallel with the plan of salvation. Um, the first scripture we wanted to go to is Genesis chapter 24. And I'll read uh, Genesis chapter 24. And I'll read the first four <coughs> verses here. It says, uh, Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, Please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country, to my family, and take a wife for my son Isaac. You know, the whole idea, in our culture here, we don't think, you know, Simeon gets older, he's not going to be looking at us saying, Mom, Dad, you know, choose go find me, me a wife. Go find me a wife. Choose me a bride. He's not going to be asking us to do that because that's not how he's been raised. That's not how we were raised. But in other cultures, this is kind of expected that the father particularly um, would end up choosing a bride for 
his, uh, his son. And where do you think they get that from? Where does that idea, do you think, stem from? The Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden. Why would you say that? Because Adam and Eve. <laughs> because Adam and Eve. Who chose Adam's bride? God. God Father. did. God did. So that's kind of where that tradition really stems from. They, they look at the father choosing the bride for Adam, and they take that, of course, very seriously. So on, uh, among the Semitic peoples, generally it's held uh, that as the divine father provided a wife for Adam, uh, the earthly father was also going to select a wife for their sons. And uh, that, that still plays out today over there, that kind of thing. Not as commonly as it used to be. No. Now you'll find also Joshua 15, uh, that, I mean, you'll find examples in Scripture how this tradition was played out, uh, even with the Scriptures. <clears throat> in Isaiah 62, I want to take you there and I want to show you how God really has done the same thing for His Son. Um, who is the bride of Christ? I'm just asking a question there. Who's the bride of Christ? That should be pretty the church. Simple. Okay, church. the church. The church is the bride of Christ. And what you're going to see is, and of course, back in the old, what we would call the Old Testament, that would have been uh, Israel, right? Would have been Israel. And when you go to Isaiah 62, Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62. I'm going to look at the first five verses there. And this is God talking about um, His church. He says, For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as the lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and the kings your glory and shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. You shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no longer be term, termed forsaken, nor shall your land be any more termed desolate. But you shall be called Hef, it's, uh, Hefzibah, Hefzibah. Hefzibah, and your land Beulah. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. So here's, here's God basically selecting a bride for his son. He knows that Christ is going to come and be the redeemer of the world, and he's going to have a bride. And so the father... God the Father is choosing a bride, and here He's choosing Israel. He's choosing His people to be His bride. And of course, anybody that that is grafted into that, anybody that becomes a Christian, uh, enters into that inheritance and becomes part of that church, part of that church, and part of the bride. Now, in, I'm going to take you to a couple places. In fact, Sim, why don't you look up Romans chapter eight? Romans chapter 8, 29 and 30. Chapter 8, what? Chapter 8, 29 and 30. Am I supposed to just read it? Go ahead. I have the King James Version. All right. For whom he he did for uh, for no, he also did predestin predestinate. Right. Is that a word? So it wasn't predestined. It was predestinate. Predestinate to be confirmed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many uh, many brethren. Moreover, whom he did he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called. Then he also justified, and whom he justified, 
them he also glorified. And King James is pretty confusing. Ephesians 1 says the same, basically the same thing. Chapter uh, 1 and verse 5 and 11, it says, uh, Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise, to the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So you have Paul in Romans, and his letter to Romans, and also to the Ephesians, basically telling us that God would have a bride. And he, in his foreknowledge, he knew who that bride would be. He's made salvation available to the entire planet, to every person. Uh, Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God to bring us salvation has appeared to all mankind. The word there is men, but mankind is the, the actual Greek word. So God's made salvation available to all mankind, but he knows in his foreknowledge who's going to become part of his bride and who will not become part of his bride. And so he, ter he terms it in, in, a, in a language that means that it's predestined, meaning that he would have a bride, he would have a church that would be victorious. Well, in this case, he's talking about the land or the country. This is Romans reading. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I didn't want you to go on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, but, but even, even part of that, even when you go to the book of Revelation, you have the holy city. The holy city is also considered the bride of Christ. And why? Because the saints dwell in the holy city. It becomes their, their home in the earth made new. So it's, it's, it's connected, right? It's all connected up. The church is well, the one thing you find people. over and over in scripture that separates God from the heathen gods is that we have a God who dwells with us. That's mm -hmm. None of the pagans, all their gods were far off, somebody distant. Mount Olympus. And this is one who wants to be with us, so close yeah. that marriage is the best illustration of yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so the, the first point there in choosing the bride, God chose us. He chose us to be part of that. Once everyone, making it available to everyone, but he knows in his foreknowledge that not everyone will become part of that. Now how about the next one? How about the go-between? Uh, the go-between, what would a go-between be? You know, you, uh, you're, you, you become of age and your Not father, trigger. your father, yeah, kind of okay, your father re recognizes that it's time for you to get married and so he doesn't himself go and uh, encounter or uh, uh, approach the family of the uh, potential bride, but he sends someone to do that, a go-between. Mm -hmm. Now, who was, who was a go-between? Who made this statement? Uh, in, this, in the Bible, it says that um, um, it's referred to in Scripture as the friend of the bridegroom. Who was considered the friend? There's only one statement in Scripture that uses those exact words, and it were, it's in reference to a particular person. Let's say John the Baptist. Okay, why? He was the forerunner to prepare the way. Yeah. It was. It was John chapter 3. It was John the Baptist used those very... He was the, the friend of the bride. The best friend man. of the bridegroom. He was the, best, the man. best man. That's what we would say today, the best man. Okay. And it was John the Baptist there. But uh, a go-between or an intermediary, you know, somebody to go. Now, there would be certain responsibilities that a, um, a go-between would have. They would have to be a friend of the Father, right? What are some other things you could think of? <clears throat> have to have discernment. Have to have discernment, right? Because well, why would he have to have discernment? What's, what, is, what, is, what is his responsibility going to be as he goes to approach a family of a potential bride? What are his responsibilities? What's his mission? What's his objective? Find the perfect bride. Well, is he just going to go to somebody and say, "Hey, you know, my my friend's father, son thinks that you're, you know, a good-looking woman. So, uh, hey, let's just go and, and get married. How about how about getting married? Is that his is that his objective? Remember, remember Sam, Samson did this with his parents. He uh, saw a Canaanite, or was it Philistine, a Philistine uh, woman? And he basically just said, 
she looks good, go get her for me. Right? But that's not the, the role of a, of a go-between of, of an intermediary. What would be his objective? He would be a negotiator. Okay, he would have. He was going to be negotiating. Now, what was he going to be negotiating? In a Middle Eastern situation like that, I mean, it's an actual contract that is is developing between the father of the groom and the father of the bride. There's a contractual type of agreement that's going to be in place there. And oh, is this where they decided a bunch of stuff like how much they were going to give? Okay, the dowry, right? Yeah, the dowry. Yeah, what the dowry price is actually going to be, and and they could negotiate all kinds of things for the, for a dowry. I was going to say right? we you know, we talked about John the Baptist, but the other one in scripture would be Abraham's servant, right? Who went to go That's find a wife. He had, he he brought with him bracelets and things to right to as the bride price to right. The go-between had to be a good negotiator, of course, and he had to keep the family's uh, best interest at heart. And of uh, uh, utmost is the family name, right? Uh, has to be maintained. And so he has to kind of determine from from uh, this family that he's talking with, uh, is this young lady really going to bring honor, you know, to the family name of my friend, etc. Um, and he, he was also informed as to what the dowry limit would be. In other words, he couldn't go in there and mm -hmm. kind of just offer the sun, moon, and, and stars, you know, and not realize that the, the father, his friend, maybe couldn't pay that, right? And they would use all kinds of things to, uh, as payment. They would use property, they would use animals, they would use, of course, money. You know, and, and gold, silver, jewels, all that kind of stuff, raiment, uh, anything that had any real in intrinsic value. And the, the thing of it was, they had to be very serious about the process. If you, uh, if you go to, to the Middle East today, and I've, I've been through this a couple of number of times being over there, uh, if you're going to go in and talk to anybody about anything, typically, you do something first. It's just tradition, it's just customary that you sit down and you have chai, you have tea. Right? That's what you do first. In this situation though, uh, a friend of the bridegroom does not, he, he refuses tea and he gets down to the serious business first and then after that they have tea to kind of celebrate the, uh, so they flip that around. Um, I mean, I've gone into carpet shops in, in Turkey and in the Middle East, and I've gone to talk to uh, government officials about different things, and before you talk any business, you have chai. It just happens that way. You know, the chai first, the tea first. But in this case here, when you're talking about a marriage negotiation, that becomes the priority, and that happens first, before there's any tea. Just shows the priority and the importance of it, and that goes on. Um, now, God would also, in uh, choosing a bride for His Son, He would also send a friend to the bridegroom. In fact, He would be the bridegroom Himself in a sense, but He would He would send. Uh, a kinsman redeemer, a negotiator, to, to negotiate the terms. Did, did Christ know eventually what it was going to cost, what the dowry was going to be for his bride? Of course. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, we've been talking about this forever in, in our studies here, but what, what is the dowry price for the bride of Christ? What's the dowry? Suffering his death and part of his divinity. Okay, it's, it's not only his human sacrifice, which most people look at and say that's the dowry. You know, Jesus suffered and he died on the cross. He shed his blood. That was the dowry price. Oh, Ac comments. Go ahead. Actually, in First John, chapter five. Um, is this the recording? I'll just take you yeah, there for a second. And Dan and Susan had said that the. Um, 
the, the friend of the bridegroom was to find a helpmeet for the son. Right. It's an honor and a prestigious position for the continuation of both families, like a preliminary examination. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, something so serious as marriage, you want to make sure it's going to work, you know. In uh, 1 John chapter 5 there, in verse uh, 9, it says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this, the two, is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has this witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the record that God has given of his Son. God established a record below Calvary of the sacrifice that his son was willing to make. And that sacrifice was not only the witness of his human death, but it was also a sacrifice uh, greater than that part of his divinity, his omnipresence. And so um, it's unfortunate that most Christians today don't aren't, aren't aware of the, the real dowry price that was paid for the bride. It was not just the human sacrifice, but it was... When God gave his son to the world, the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave, he gave him to the human family, knowing that that dowry price would be an eternal presence, his eternal presence to cover the transgression of an eternal law. And, Do you know, uh, if, you, if a woman was betrothed under the old circumstances with the, the bridegroom and the negotiations, you know, a, a lot of that a lot of her, because she didn't have a lot of contact with the groom to really know him, per se, right. but to be considered so valuable that he would offer a high price for her, also affected the way she treated him her when they husband. when they got together. Right. You know, when she felt valued and treasured like right. that, right. you know, she would be more motivated to bring him honor and and be a, a loyal wife to him because he had paid so much he wanted her so to what you're saying price. there is if, if people <clears throat> recognized how much God really had to pay to make to salvation available yeah, they would they would think differently and live differently if they really recognized that he not you know I guess a lot of people think okay Jesus a lot of people think he just came down and paid off the mortgage kind of thing came down gave his life but he went back to heaven you know three days later so, um, you know, here you have, you know, here you have a, a, a potential thinking of, okay, he suffered and he died, but he got to go back to heaven, you know, I mean, did he really, you know, I mean, even though it was a sacrifice, was it all that significant? You know, I don't, I mean, obviously it was in order to. And that also should change our estimation of what our worth is yeah, and right, what the exactly. worth of each other, yeah. how much he values. So it makes it much more important to begin sharing truth with others because we begin to recognize how much he values yeah. each of us. And yeah. you know, it it's, makes evangelism and outreach a much more high priority when you recognize that value. I think so, absolutely. <coughs> okay, so you have the go-between there, uh, the intermediary doing his thing. And we see, of course, examples of that in Scripture as well. And we see Christ playing that role for his bride himself. Uh, the next one is... Um, yeah, the next one is uh, the betrothal. Right? Um, that's the formal request. The formal request after they negotiate all of the uh, the terms of the contract, that's the uh, you know what the dowry is going to be, uh, etc. And what was the purpose of the dowry in these Middle Eastern weddings? What was the purpose of the dowry? Here you have this young woman, right? So and you're actually you're contract. actually you're actually buying her. You're contractually technically kind of buying. Her. Well, to what's going to happen? Extent, to she... some extent, that would that money would probably go toward the preparation for the wedding. Yeah. For all of the things okay. that. So you're not really buying her, but what <clears> you're <throat> doing, you're giving the money to the family, mm. right? Because that family is going to lose 
an important word. The per there. productivity of that young lady. Uh, lots of things that women do around the house, around the farm, etc. So you're you're basically <coughs> one family is asking the other family, you know, we want to take that pr productivity away from you. And here's what we're giving to you in place of that. Right. Now a lot of times in the negotiation, a lot of times the the that that father of the bride, he would turn around and say, here, dear, here's a gift for you for from your family. Here's a wedding gift. If they were pretty well off and they they could have servants, you know, pick up the slack or something, they would offer that as a gift to the to the uh, wedding couple, etc., whatever. But when you looked at what um, Abraham's servant took with him when he went looking for a bride, right? You know, we we remember that you know that he brought <clears throat> gold bracelets or something like that, but instead he took with him like ten camels. I think so. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty big caravan to take. We took ten camels. So I guess the camels and the, were loaded with all kinds of treasure that he was going to offer. Right. You know, it, was, it was like really like the king. Right. He the knew, king of that area he knew the dowry the price that Abraham was willing to pay, etc. Right. Now, uh, Jacob, for example, um, he ended up doing what to pay a dowry price to uh, Laban? He worked. He, he worked. You see, that's another thing you could do. You didn't have to pay with land or animals or mm -hmm. money. You could mm -hmm. work and give your service, and so he ended up thinking that he was uh, giving seven years of service to Laban for Rachel, to come to find out that Leah was the oldest, she was married off first, and then he decided, I really love Rachel, I'm going to spend another seven years, so he spent 14 years in uh, well, Technically, getting... Jacob should have had a vast amount of resources to offer for a bride, but because he fled from... Right from his parents' home, he didn't have that inheritance to offer. Right. Now after the um, uh, official betrothal, there is immediately follows as, a, as a, f a festival or a feast, immediately follows that. And we see this in uh, Genesis 24 with Abraham. Uh, here's just one example, Genesis chapter 24. Um, are you still there, Sam, in that? I'm on it, sir. Genesis 24, 53, 54. The servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and her mother precious things. And they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night. And they rose up in the morning, and he <coughs> said, Send me away unto my master. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> now, we did mention already that, um, of course, Christ, the dowry that was paid for the, the, uh, the church, was basically Christ's human sacrifice and his divine offering, which is listed there also in Ephesians 5, 1 to 2. He loved us so much he gave a, a sacrifice and an offering. Um, <coughs> in the typical Middle Eastern marriage, the dowry goes from one family to the next family, right? Uh, and then they decide what they're going to do with it. Who did, who did the dowry go to uh, for the church? You know, God paid a dowry, right? It was <clears throat> the, the human life and the... I guess to all the human family. So who did the dowry go to? Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Is death right? So the dowry really went to the, the death, the grave, etc. Uh, ultimately, Satan rejoiced at that, thinking that he had gained a real great victory. Right? But he didn't realize what was playing. He didn't realize the script that was playing out. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it tells us that had they known, they would have never, they would have never sacrificed Christ. Yeah. Right? They know what was really going on there. 1 Corinthians mm -hmm. chapter 2, talking about uh, Christ's crucifixion there, it says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are, the, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, including Satan. For had they known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. So if, 
they didn't realize that by crucifying him where they did, in the Ark of the Covenant being below, the mercy seat being below, um, the Kaporeth there, which is the place of atonement, that his blood that. came down and anointed that mercy seat and sealed the marriage of his two offerings, thus providing the dowry for his, his church. So if, if they had known all of how that was going to play out, they never would have put him up there. You know? <clears throat> but just fascinating how that all worked out. Um, okay, after the betrothal uh, contract is official, the bride and the groom, they don't see one another until the wedding ceremony, typically. Right? And that's the same thing that happened really with God's church. Christ <clears throat> paid the, the dowry price. He was resurrected. And he, he went back to heaven. You know, we can't, we can't go see him right now, you know, because the wedding ceremony actually hasn't taken place yet, right? I mean, it's been, it's been offered to him in heaven to, in a technical sense, right? But we're waiting for the coming of the bridegroom, aren't we? That's what we're waiting for. And why did the bridegroom go away? You know, to prepare, prepare a, place. a place. Basically, for us. in most cases, in the Eastern that's what they would wedding, do. The the groom would go to build a house. They'd go build a house exactly, mm -hmm. and that's what uh, that's why in Matthew twenty five mm -hmm. we have that parable of the ten virgins, where they're they're sitting there. Christ is sitting there with the disciples, watching this scene unfold, of the virgins that are waiting for the bridegroom, who typically comes at midnight. It's what's interesting is they come at midnight, you know. So, I mean, this, all this Middle Eastern stuff is the same stuff that's playing out in reality. I don't know that it's typically at midnight, but, it, but it was. It, was it drags out, it usually drags out till midnight. What was interesting was that you don't know when the groom goes off to prepare a right. place, you don't know how long it's going to take. take. Yeah. So, the bride is in this state of anticipation, right. and she won't know when the wedding will take place. Until so, one of the servants, the advance runners, who come, right. tell them that the bridegroom is on his way. Right. So this, right. you know, like in our thing, we have all this. You know, we plan the date, we plan all of this thing, all the guests. It's all scheduled. Well, in that case, until the until the house was ready, the bridegroom didn't leave to come and come and take the bride back. And there might so. be a number of things that cause his delay, right? Because he he's he's <clears throat> also getting his kind of crew or friends business together. Fairs, business yeah, fairs he's, he's getting everything set up as well. But yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Christ went away. We can't see him right now. He's preparing a place for us. And he's going to come back and get us to take us where he wants us to be. You know, same thing. So lots of preparations for the blessed day. Um, certainly, um, from the bride's perspective, you've got the garments and the cosmetics and the jewelry and the the different things that, that she would have to adorn herself, because this is a very special time. Um, one of the things that has to take place for both of the bride and the groom uh, is a special bath. They have to have a special bath, etc. Um, I liken that, um, I see in that an illustration of a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the end of time to fit God's people up for, in fact, that's what it says in Revelation 19, the Christ, you know, Christ is coming back because the bride is now ready. That's what it says. He, he, he returns because the, he knows when the bride is ready, right? When you read that. She's readied herself. Revelation 19 talks about that. Um, well, scripture says, Be ye ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. So the bride has to stay in a state of readiness for whenever yeah. it happens. This is verse 6 there. It says, I heard, as it were, the voice of great multitude is the sound of many waters and is the sound of, of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. So, again, it's, 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 there's a preparation Special outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which I see is that is that bath that the bride and groom take, and it's interesting. It's uh, a cleansing time. A cleansing mean. times. Let me just read Ezekiel 16, <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 16, which is a very fascinating chapter all by itself. But in uh, Ezekiel 16, 10 to 13, it says this here. Uh, well, actually, I'll go back to verse 9 because it says, Now I washed you in water. Yes, I thoroughly washed off 
your blood and I anointed you with oil. And then verse 10 says, I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skins. I clothed you with the fine linen and covered you with silk. I adored you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears. There you go, ladies. And a beautiful crown on your feet, on your head. Right? <clears throat> Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor, which I had bestowed on you, says the Lord God. He's talking about his church there. He's talking about how he has provided for his church and, and made his, his church, his bride, ready and uh, an example in the world. And uh, all of those things that they do customarily in a wedding, a minister wedding, here God is doing to prepare his church um, for that, that time when the bridegroom will come. And that, of course, is the second coming of Christ when he comes to receive his church. Right? And he, he's coming to take his church to, to be uh, where he is, that home that he's gone and provided the, uh, in the New Jerusalem there. So I just thought it was fascinating that, that you have within... Obviously, all these principles are biblical principles concerning the plan of salvation. And it's interesting how different <coughs> Middle Eastern cultures have picked, <coughs> picked up various pieces of those uh, of that plan and actually applied it to their own individual circumstance. But it's interesting and, that once the wedding took place, they had a feast for seven days. For seven days. They also had a feast for seven days after the death of someone. Right. They had the burial was was immediately within 24 hours, but then they would they would get together and have a feast in the the family's home for the right. week after. So it's like these seven day periods you find over and over in scripture. Yeah. They call that a wake. No, um, they call it sitting shiva. Sitting shiva. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's unfortunate that in our culture here in the United States, and I guess maybe Western cultures, um, we've lost all of the sig a basic significance. The reason we, the call the, we call those things awake here is because they would have that in the home because of the possibility that somebody might actually be in a coma and watch to see if they, they would wake, wake up. Wake up. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the things that we talked yeah, about. Yeah, we, we were talking about some of the customs that we have and where the terms came from. And I'd always wondered, why did they call the after service when somebody dies, why do they call it a wake? Mm -hmm. But it's because they would all sit with the dead person would be laid out in the home mm -hmm. and they would they would stay there and they, someone would actually stay out with them all night long in case they woke up. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a superstitious thing also for a long time during like the thirties. That's because a lot of people were buried alive, yeah. Alive. They're buried alive One because out they were twenty five. It's a lot. Seems like a lot, one out of 25. Maybe of the, of the coffins that they dug up to reuse, one out of 25 of them. That'd be, that's pretty sad. But anyway, it's interesting, coming back to the marriage theme, how uh, we see and have lost in our culture a lot of those things that tie uh, marriage to the plan of salvation. And that's unfortunate. So. And I'm not sure where Elijah's going to take the next study. <clears throat> but again, we're just basically with continuing, marriage and family and continue a marriage and family next week. Uh, yeah. I think he's going to <clears throat> Corinthians somewhere. There was a chapter in Corinthians he wanted to go through. So we'll be doing that next week. <clears throat> so. Good study. Any final comments? Or? Is there anybody's posted anything? Mm -hmm. Scott said, oh wow, here it goes. The, this delay because it takes so long for them to see the video from when they were doing it. We got some comments here. Okay, go ahead and share. Scott said, as Abraham's servant went and drew Rebecca for Isaac, the Holy Spirit works as God's servant to draw men unto him. Yeah, there you go. Nice. And his John six forty four, God draws men yeah. to his son as his bride. Yeah. The Holy Spirit also brings gifts to his bride in terms of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yeah. There Great. You go. Yeah, you see all those things are connected. It's, it's great. And that's why, that's why we got you guys out there. 
to uh, add to the insight here. So thank you so much for that. So. It's very nice. I appreciate those comments. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I see our time is gone, and uh, let me uh, invite you and those of you out there. Thank you for joining us, and let's go ahead and let's just bow our heads and have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we want to thank you for the insights that you provide in your word. We want to thank you for uh, your wonderful plan of salvation. Uh, heaven certainly has written a script that is life-saving uh, and eternal. And we're so grateful that we can understand it, uh, certainly in part, and when we're where you are, uh, Lord Jesus, uh, even to a greater extent. I want to thank you that these uh, institutions of marriage are there to help remind us of the incredible plan of salvation that you provided. And we pray that uh, you'll be honored and glorified uh, through the marriages that we all have. And we ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Pray also that you'll bless all those who uh, join us today. They'll receive the blessing you stored up for us. And that uh, you'll bless the food that we're going to partake of. And it'll nourish and strengthen our bodies for, for your service, for your bride. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. <coughs> Yeah, and Susan said it's a privilege to have this opportunity. God bless you for making this available to us. Always nice to hear from you guys, our Canadian cousins and family. Anyway, thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place. Uh, you folks have a great and blessed week. God willing. Amen. We'll catch you then.